Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, September 6th, 2024. Good to have you on board, everyone. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me in the virtual studio today is my colleague, Bill Bray, the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings. We're gonna give an overview of the main topics in the September issue. Happy Friday, Bill. Happy Friday. All right, um, I'm gonna take a second and brag about Bill because he is an adjunct faculty member at the Naval Academy. He doesn't know I'm gonna say this, by the way. <laughs> but he teaches the ethics course uh, that all midshipmen have to take during their sophomore year, their youngster year at the Naval Academy. And last night, Bill was honored as the 2024 Ethics Instructor of the Year. Uh, so Bill, just uh, tell us a little bit about that course, when it was established and why it was established and what some of the major uh, themes of the course. Um, sure, and thank you very much. Uh, so the course was a, a, a its establishment was actually a kind of a process that started in the late 80s after the Iran-Contra scandal, which involved, unfortunately, several Naval Academy graduates. And Congress was asking hard questions of all the service academies of the Department of Defense. What do you teach for ethics to midshipmen, cadets, et cetera? And it, and it went back and forth for several years, and it was written into appropriation bills, you know, come tell us what you do, blah, blah, blah. And the service academies, the answers they were giving Congress were not completely satisfactory. Um, and then the uh, Naval Academy had its uh, cheating scandal in December. Of, well, the exam was given in December of uh, 1992. This is the electrical engineering scandal. And uh, it was the class of 94. And um, that is a story I won't really go into, but it, it had multiple phases and it, it was a very bad thing. And this is the point when Congress said, OK, we're kind of done with asking and we're going to start telling and uh you know we want you to establish a, a explicit course not a little bit of this a little bit of that some start in plebe summer blah 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 um and so it was uh, established in the mid 90s under uh, admiral larson's uh, second tenure as a superintendent so it's been running now for um not quite 30 years it's it's changed a little bit over the years the naval academy teaches it to youngsters as you mentioned the air force academy in West Point teach it to first class. The reason the Naval Academy chose youngsters is they want to get this course uh, taught to them prior to their, their decision on what we call two for seven night, their, their kind of vesting point at the academy when they decide to you know, stay at the academy and then uh, incur the obligation of, of five years, minimum five years after graduation. That's why it's called two more years of school and, and five more years is two for seven. So that's what happened. Um, and the course is uh, set up in you know four main main blocks: uh, moral awareness. The first couple of weeks was, which is you know how do you um, how do you under how do you recognize when you're in a morally ambiguous situation, an ethically ambiguous situation? Because it, the course is not about you know teaching them right from wrong. We assume they know that they know not to steal their wall, you know, roommate's wallet and things like you know. So it's more about you know, really, you're going to be in some really tricky, murky ethical situations as a as an officer. And um, how do you recognize that? Then the next part of the course is um, called the more deliberation uh, roadmap phase of the course, which is, OK, here's ways to think about um, an ethical issue uh, kind of step by step. And then the third part of the course is a character virtue block, which is, you know, why why do you need to be an excellent person from a virtuous person and how do you do that so there's some aristotle in there uh others and then the final part of the course is uh just war uh just war theory and um which is very applicable of course in, in the ethic world of ethics so it's a really interesting course um i think the midshipmen most of them really like it um it's a kind of a break from some of the more heavy stem courses they're taking and they can uh, think and 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 and, and talk. It's it's taught in a kind of a seminar style, and on Mondays the the academy has five uh, full time philosophers on the staff. These are PhDs in philosophy, and they teach the theory on Monday, and the 
adjuncts um, or the military officers assigned to the academy that teach the course. Um, we teach Tuesday, Thursday case studies. So we kind of take the theory, apply it to the case studies that are in the course, but also they want us to bring in, you know, our experiences in, in the fleet. Um, so that's that's it. Yeah, what, what's one of the most famous case studies that's taught every year? Uh, we do Abergrave, the prison scandal. Um, you know, how did that happen? Um, and the breakdowns in, uh, you know, command and control and, and uh, how the uh, young uh, MPs uh, kind of got socialized into this culture where, where it became okay. Some of them, uh, there was a couple clear bad apples in this, but there were also others that just kind of felt uneasy about it and why are we doing this? But then over time, as they did a little bit, little bit, they became more comfortable with it. This is a very common uh, situation in, in the ethical world. It happens everywhere, companies, you know, teams, sports teams, whatever. Um, so that's a big case. We uh, teach a, um, and you may remember this bill, the, um, it was 1988, but the uh, uh, CEO of the Dubuque who didn't pick up the, uh, the boat people out of Vietnam um yeah. and um that ended up uh, resulting in his court martial but the, the the case is you know why didn't he do it and why he was kind of rationalizing ways not to do it um because it was inconvenient and he was you know he was under time pressure and blah 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 those are two of of, of several yeah those are good ones it's a very important course and i remember being uh you know just a few years out of the academy when the that electrical engineering scandal broke the cheating scandal uh, a lot of discussion about it there was some discussion about it in proceedings actually and uh, at our annual meeting i think in the in 1993 or 1994 and so it's, i remember some of the the things that were starting to roll the ball was starting to roll towards establishing this class at that time so uh again you know glad to have you in, in the classroom over there at loose hall and also congrats on on being honored uh last night for being the, the teacher of the year. That's that's pretty awesome. Thank you. Uh, coming up on our events calendar, uh, next month on October 17th, the Naval Institute and the Naval Academy will be doing our annual fall conference. So every year we do an event uh, with the Naval Academy. It's a, it's a collaboration between the Naval Institute and the uh, faculty uh, at the Naval Academy. And this year, the one, this year's uh, conference is titled Securing the Nation, Energy Security, fortifying the defense industrial base and strengthening infrastructure resilience. Uh, one of the keynote speakers will be Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dr. Daniel Jurgen. Uh, he is an author and consultant within the energy and economic sector. Uh, this is gonna be a fantastic, it's a one day event. It'll be at the Naval Institute in our uh, uh, Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. Uh, so to register, go to usni.org events. You can find the uh, the flyer, the information about it. But, uh, uh, this, you know, we're talking about energy security. We're talking about uh, the defense industrial base. And so that's certainly been a topic in the last uh, couple of years as the U.S. and other uh, NATO nations have been gearing up industrial capacity uh, to help not just build up our own uh, military, but also to build up and help uh, you know Ukraine sustain its war against uh, Russia, uh, and then the other topic is um, you know how are how are the uh, the uh, armed forces uh, you know dealing with climate change and sea level rise and you know these are things that are impacting uh, even the Naval Academy. The Naval Academy's got a plan you know for the next thirty years how they're going to deal with the fact that uh, the sea level is rising and more and more of the seawall is underwater more and more consistently and often. Uh, we see it out on Hospital Point all the time. The, the road that runs along the, the mausoleum there uh, is underwater a couple different days a month. And the Academy's plan is to move some of those facilities and uh, let, the, you know, let the road go back to, uh, uh, to being you know, just a, a, a natural buffer zone and move the mausoleum, the crematorium, not crematorium, but the, where, where the cremains are kept uh, uphill uh, to, uh, to higher ground. So, um, you know, the way that the military is dealing with some of these uh, environmental issues of the day uh, is going to be discussed as well. So there'll be panel discussions, there'll be keynote speakers. It's going to be a great event. It always is a great event uh, with a different topic every fall, but we're happy to do this one 
uh, with the Naval Academy, with the academic uh, faculty, uh, and bring in lots of great outside speakers. So look for that 17 October. You can attend in person uh, or you can attend virtually because it will be a simulcast. Um, all right, now let's get to a couple topics. Um, we want to talk about the September issue of proceedings. And we also want to talk about uh, some conversation that we had yesterday with our editorial board. Um, this was one that uh, we, we discussed with, uh, with the ed board and with our CEO, uh, Admiral Spicer, yesterday. Uh, what, what spurred the discussion about the open forum was uh, some comments on an article that we published in the August proceedings. It was by uh, you know, Dr. Captain John Cordell um, and a co-author, Reuben Green. Um, and the title of the article is The Tragedy of the Lost Generation. Uh, and it looks at, it, it's a very fact, facts-based uh, piece about um, the, the impact of Senator John Stennis, for which the USS John C. Stennis, CVN-74, is named. Um, but Stennis was a, uh, a big fan of the, of the Navy, and he was, uh, he's, he was behind several of the uh, Navy build-up acts in the, 19th, in the uh, early 20th century that led you know, to U.S. preparedness for the war in World War II. Uh, but at the same time, he also was a staunch, he was a staunch racist. And uh, he, he took action, including the letter that was shown in that article uh, that um, uh, led to a uh, underrepresentation of African-Americans uh, at the service academies. And Stennis wrote in several, several letters, it, it, there is factual evidence that that he uh, was doing everything he could to make sure that very few African Americans from the South, uh, he was from Mississippi, um, but other other states as well, you know, got into the service academies. And so uh, uh, Captain Cordell and Reuben Green, you know, pulled that out. You know, they they did some research and and looked at what the uh, you know sort of the over time the 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 fewer African Americans that showed up at the service academies as a result of those actions, right? Um, anyway, so you know, people people opined about it. Uh, some people on Facebook were uh, at, reacted to it very strongly, which led to the discussion with our Ed Board about the fact that some people don't understand uh, the open form of proceedings, and and they assume that you know we've taken a position. Uh, in general, we don't take a position. We, we provide the open forum for people like Cordell and Green to publish on, on topics that are of interest, that are of importance to the U.S. military, to the Naval, the sea services. Uh, and yes, sometimes we, we talk about, uh, about social issues, right? Um, it's not every, every article in, in every issue. It's, it's usually you know, one or fewer than one. Uh, in each issue, but we uh, we do publish on uh, uh, social issues, um, and you know if you have a different op opinion, if you want to uh, you know comment on it, uh, you're welcome to comment on it. Uh, but we just provide the open forum for it. Um, what a lot of people didn't understand is uh, you know just a, a month previous in the July issue, we published a piece by uh, a Marine Marine Corps Captain Carl Flynn. Uh, that basically said there shouldn't be affirmative action in the military. Uh, you know, Flynn was saying, it, it, you know, affirmative action had its day, but it's come and gone. Um, and it should all be about competence. Every, every selection for officers and service academies should be about choosing the best, most qualified candidate. Uh, that's a strong argument. We published that argument uh, in the July issue. Uh, so social issues have been in proceedings uh, for time and memorial, you know, back to our start, um, there's always uh, room for the for topics, uh, including you know, women in combat. Um, don't ask, don't tell was debated. Uh, you know, uh, the tail hook event of 1991 and the aftermath of that. You know, you know, these are all what some people would call social issues. Um, it's not it's not the lion's share of what we publish in proceedings, but we do give uh, voice to to people who want to, you know, tackle social issues. So I don't know, what other things stood out to you in the conversation we had with the Ed Board yesterday? Yeah, I mean, that's all right. And uh, it is a very small, what you would consider social diversity issues, a very small, uh, less than 2% of, of our 
publishing output in the last at least I've been here six years. Um, I, you know, I would just say that we, in the six years I've been here, you know, we pro obviously we provide an open forum for viewpoints on all kinds of issues that are relevant to the C services. Um, and we've had, for example, Force Design 2030 been a very controversial issue in the Marine Corps. Uh, General Berger's initiative is now being carried on by General Smith. And um, we've had articles for, you know, supporting Force Design 2030. We've had articles opposing it, aspects of it, what have you. In all those articles on that subject and any other one you can mention that has anything to do with the sea services, I, we never got a complaint or I have never seen a complaint that we're taking a position. The United States Naval Institute is taking a position on Force Design 2030, even though we provide a forum for pro and con or, or any other issue until it gets to diversity. As soon as we publish something about a diversity issue that is relevant to the sea services, and this one is in all of them, the one we do, suddenly we are taking a position. And it, it's interesting to me that that subject triggers people to think that we're taking a position. I mean, we're not taking a position. We're providing, as you said so eloquently, we're just providing a, a forum for that kind of debate. And we apply our same editorial standards to that. We don't, we don't publish things, you know, people don't see what we reject on these subjects. We reject quite a bit uh, for and against uh, because it doesn't meet our editorial standards. It isn't fact-based. It isn't, you know, it's an ad hominem attack and it's not a, you know, an argument on an issue. It's, um, it's a rant or something like that. So that is the truth. I, I would just offer that to people that, you know, um, you, we clearly don't take positions, but if, if you think we do because we allow that voice to be, um, to be heard, then I, I don't know. I can't help you. Yeah. Um, there are, I think I think you know you and I we talk about these topics all the time and we talk about the you know trying to find the the center point for a reasoned professional argument right so if if you're looking for the fringes of any argument you're not going to ever find that in proceedings we're not going to publish uh, the fringe as you said rants um, for or against you know whatever the topic is we're looking for professional. It can't be ad hominem. It can't be political. It can be it can be a critique of policy. You can say, you know, this administration or that administration should have done or should not have done this or that, and then and then examine the policy or examine the strategy. Uh, but you can't say, you know, President Trump or President Biden or President Obama, you know, blah blah blah. Right? We take the politics out of it and we can examine the policy. Um, but we're always looking for, as we did in this case, I think if you look at Carl Flynn's article in July and you look at Cordell and Green in, in the August issue, there, those are two things about diversity uh, that are very well written, very professionally written by people who take the topic seriously and who think there needs to be a debate in the, in the, the C services on those topics. Um, and we're, we're looking for, you know, if, if, you, if you've got an opinion, if you've got a, uh, a facts-based opinion and you want to weigh into the discussion, please bring it. Um, if all you've got is, uh, you know, reactionary, you know, either strong left wing or right wing or any wing um, uh, commentary on something, it's probably not for proceedings. It's probably for, you know, there's a, there's a lot of other websites out there. There's a lot of social media uh, accounts out there where you can get the rants. And if you like the rants, uh, you know, you won't find them here. If you don't like the rants, the Naval Institute is a place where we can have that, you know, professional seasoned, uh, serious conversation around anything, whether it's how many aircraft carriers does the Navy need, you know, force design 2030, or, you know, does diversity have a place, uh, you know, in policy and in, in the sea services. So, Enough about that. Let's let's get on and talk about um, the September issue. Uh, so we've got the winners of the Future of Naval Warfare Essay Contest, which is the final chapter of the American Sea Power Project. So we started the American Sea Power Project early in 2021. The final chapter of it was this essay contest uh, sponsored by the Smith Richardson um, uh, Foundation. Uh, they gave us money to uh, to run this contest. We asked people to look at our War of 2026 scenario from last uh, December 
and the articles that were written by subject matter experts, Bill Toady on submarines, for example, uh, T.J. White and company on cyber warfare, uh, Admiral Brian Brown on space warfare, et cetera. And then take that one step further, you know, react to those articles. Um, how would you, you know, either continue the fight or, you know, look at capabilities and, and uh, requirements that the military needs in order to be prepared for that war of 2026 scenario. Um, to our to our somewhat surprise, instead of going further down into the tactical or the capabilities discussion, the three winners took the conversation back up to the operational and strategic level of war. Uh, the first prize winner is uh, Commander Justin Cobb, um, and his article is titled, No One Should Think the War Will Be Short. Um, and this is uh, you know, a, a strong article where he says, um, you know, it's important to convince China that a war for Taiwan will become protracted um, and that there'll be, a, a, you know, that will create a strong deterrent. In other words, you know, if China, if and when, uh, you know, China decides that they want to retake Taiwan by, by force, uh, that the U.S. has a strategy and has capability in our adversaries uh, to make it a protracted war, an expensive war, one that will not end quickly, uh, and then he talks about, you know, what what those capabilities look like. Uh, I won't give away. Uh, I don't want to do a, a spoiler, uh, you know, for this article. It's a terrific article. Everyone should should take a glance at it. Uh, but one of the things uh, that that stood out for me was his conversation around um, exquisite capabilities versus uh, which are often in very small numbers. Right, the United States military. We often like to have exquisite capabilities. Uh, but in this case, uh, we, we should probably put, as Commander Cobb puts it, you know, more effort into building uh, the numbers of our current systems up, uh, capabilities that can stand in uh, close to the Chinese, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hinterlands um, and also survive. Um, and so fewer, fewer exquisite capabilities that are kind of coming in the next five to 10 years and more capabilities, more munitions, um, more capabilities that uh, that can help, you know, deter and defend and 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 create a protracted conflict that the Chinese would see as and say, yeah, not today. As uh, Admiral Paparo has said, we want them to continue to wake up every day uh, in Beijing and think today is not the day. Right. Um, Bill, you worked on uh, the second prize winner, which was by uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Huff. Uh, talk about that one for a minute. Yeah, Daniel Huff, who's uh, currently on the uh, Third MEF, uh, Third Marine Expeditionary Force uh, staff in Okinawa, uh, in, as an operational planner, very close to the problem. And so his article is about um, it's about deterrence, and that for deterrence to work, you need presence. You need to be in places as many places as possible. And, and the Marine Corps in Japan, um, you know, really needs to try to be in other places besides the main island, Okinawa, and, and of course, uh, mainland Japan. Um, but to do that requires, and the crux of his article is really the diplomatic process to get the Japanese government to agree to that is, um, shall we say, onerous. Um, for good reasons, the Japanese uh, goes back to explains the Japanese Constitution, Article Nine, and it takes you through the um, the the ap approval process for Marines to exercise or be present in other parts of uh, Japan, particularly in the Okinawa Prefecture, um, and um, whether they're J other JSDF bases or um, public land, private land in Japan. There's a, a multi-step process, which takes too long. And for the Marines to be a stand-in force, really a stand-in force in this area, they can't, they can't initiate this process when things are either get hot or about to get hot. It's too late. Um, deterrence then has failed. Um, so most of the article really is in information for people who don't understand that. When we write about stand-in forces and we talk about EABs and all this, we tend to gloss over this diplomatic process, whether it's with Japan, the Philippines, or other countries, and how this this is not 1941. I mean, we, we can't just go plop in there. I mean, just so um, um, that's 
it, it's good. His recommendation is essentially the United States government needs to work harder uh, in a diplomatic front um, to convince the Japanese uh, to relax some of this uh, some of this approval process, make it more flexible, more agile. Um, there is, there's a, we're at a moment in time where the, it, it, it may happen because Japan's um, uh, government and the public are, are moving further down to saying this is a real threat and we need to make some adjustments, both in um, you know, constitutional adjustments, the way that JSDF is allowed to um, posture itself, et cetera. So that's the gist of the article. It's very well done. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Major Brian Kerr, now, now Lieutenant Colonel Brian Kerr's uh, article that we published last December about putting 3MEF in a fighting stance. And uh, it's interesting to see how many uh, authors are coming out of 3MEF. So a lot of Marines are going forward uh, to 3, 3MEF, uh, being you know stationed there in Okinawa and looking at the problem you know very close up. Uh, and doing a lot of thinking about it and writing about it. And so uh, this one, uh, Colonel Huff's piece, uh, definitely, it, 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 um, I, I don't think he worked on it with, uh, with Brian Kirk's um, uh, assistance, but I think they worked together out there at 3MEF. And I think, uh, you know, they definitely nest together, right? The two different articles uh, nest together very well. Um, but the point about, you know, everything has got to be done with in, in an alliance or partnership. Um, but that in, involves, in this case, you know, kind of getting to the operational level of war or operational level of that alliance structure. You know, hey, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, hurdles to moving U.S. forces, Marine Corps forces around within the Japanese uh, home islands. Um, and, you know, if we want to be able to you know, move forward, do that stand in force kind of operations, set up the EABs uh, within Japan um, as a deterrent force that uh, you got to be able to do that in a in much more agile way than we can currently do uh, with the Japanese in, in a peacetime footing. So it's a great piece. Um, the third article, the third prize winner uh, is a repeat prize winning uh, author, um, Major Ryan Ratcliffe, U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, and his piece is called uh, Prize Law Can Help the United States Win the War of 2026. Um, and, and this one, uh, in a lot of ways, it helps to uh, flip one of China's greatest advantages today, which is its very large and strong merchant marine capability, and make that a huge uh, attack surface for the U.S. military uh, all around the world, right? And so... Uh, shutting down. This this one reminds me a bit of um, uh, Captain Tom Clarity's piece, uh, also from uh, from last year. Um, but you know, you, you don't want to go running into the maw of the Chinese A two A D capabilities when you can attack them on the periphery, when you can go after their weaknesses, when you can, uh, to use a, a point by Nick Lambert, um, a Mahanian point, you can derange the adversary's economy. Uh, and so China's merchant fleet around the world, um, prize law, uh, although we haven't practiced prize law, we haven't seized prizes since at least World War II, uh, prize law still exists. Prize law is still an, an option in warfare. It is a legal option in warfare. And uh, it, is, um, it, it would allow us to turn that uh, Chinese advantage into a very large attack surface uh, that would undermine their economy, their wartime economy. Uh, and could also help um, uh, add to one of the weaknesses that the United States has or, or soften a weakness that we have, which is that our um, merchant fleet, uh, particularly in wartime, probably isn't big enough. Yeah. So anyway, the, the prize law piece, is very it's a, it's a terrific article by uh, Major Ratcliffe. And then it's followed by another article uh, that which is titled Heave to and Prepare to be Boarded. We won't talk too much about this, but this is by two Navy JAG Corps officers who also delve deeper into the legalities, uh, into the law of armed conflict legalities of prize law. Uh, and that shows up on pages 36 and 37 of the September proceedings. So I recommend Major Ratcliffe's article and then the following article by the two JAG, JAG Corps officers, which is just terrific. 
Um, all right, Bill. Now we also had a couple of we had a nice uh, um, package, two articles on shipbuilding, um, as we talked about in the, the podcast. Uh, Brian uh, O'Rourke and I did last month. Uh, we want to do more emphasis on shipbuilding and get after the problems that the Navy's been having building ships on time, on budget, et cetera. Um, and so we had these two articles, the first one by uh, Lieutenant Kim, and, and you worked on that one. Yeah, uh, Lieutenant uh, Gary Kim, uh, he was uh, his preferred name, uh, it goes by Gary. Um, I had a pleasure of uh, meeting Gary uh, last uh, spring at the Service Navy Association um, uh, annual awards, uh, uh, their symposium and awards. Um, and um, Gary was a CB. I mean, I say was because he's left the Navy. He's, I think he's an affiliate in the reserves. He's at the uh, Wharton School of Business right now. He His desire, his intent is to, uh, once he completes his uh, MBA, is to get into the shipbuilding business um, as a career. So he really knows what he's talking about. Um, this article is about... Um, a case for a fifth naval, uh, a fifth, I'm sorry, a fifth public shipyard in the United States. So the United States had eight uh, prior to the end of the Cold War public shipyards, um, and uh, the uh, four went away um, after the, uh, uh, you know, the Cold War ended during the peace dividend. Um, Boston, um, Brooklyn, uh, or I'm, I might get these wrong. So, I, but uh, um, Charles, Mayor, Mayor Island in California was another one, yeah. and. Um, and the uh, the Navy is currently studying uh, whether a fifth one um, it, well is needed, and if so, where and how and all that. Um, and so he takes uh, takes the reader through um, the things that need to be considered if the Navy and Congress decide yes, let's let's go for a fifth public shipyard. Um, and it's it's quite complex. Um, you could go um, try to reopen a closed shipyard, but that's very difficult. And a lot that land has been repurposed for by cities and local municipalities for other purposes. So it'd be very disruptive, um, particularly in Charlestown in, in Boston. Um, and um, there's also concerns about um, climate change and where you're going to put this when it comes to sea level rise, the heat uh, that these workers have to work in. Um, there's uh, issues about a, an accessible labor force nearby a fifth naval shipyard. It can't be too close to an existing public shipyard because then you're basically just uh, poaching labor from one shipyard to another and they're in competition with each other for you know salaries. Um, and then there's um, you know the cost of living, wherever th this is. Um, so um, he does uh, take you through this, all these considerations, and then um, proposes two sites in the United States that would be best for a fifth name shipper. I'm not going to say what they are because I don't want to spoil the article for people, <laughs> but uh, um, it's, it is a real challenge, uh, you know, but it's, uh, there are much bigger advantages for the, um, for the service, both the Navy and the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard's got a, a, a challenge um, for, for a public shipyard vices, trying to build more ships in private yards. That's, that's got a lot of challenges. Um, private comp, you know, private shipyards, um, if they don't get steady orders and steady things, they have to, you know, pivot to other things to, you know, keep themselves um, solvent and keep business going. So public yards, uh, for a lot of reasons, are better um, for the for the service. Yeah, and uh, a related article on uh, ship shipbuilding is uh, by Tyler Pitchroff. The title is uh, "The Shipyard Shortage Is a People Problem," and this looks at uh, Cramp and Sons, uh, a private shipyard that was uh, created um, uh, by William Cramp and, and later his family, uh, stood up in the 1830s, uh, built some of the early U.S. Navy ships uh, early on and built ships for the United States Navy uh, through the Civil War and the, you know, 1898 and, and uh, build up into uh, uh, World War I. The, the shipyard was closed in 1927 and its workers dispersed. And then the Navy resurrected the yard in the early 1940s as part of the World War II buildup. Uh, but one of the things it found when that when the shipyard came back to life in the 40s was it was easier to rebuild the facilities than it was to rebuild the workforce. And so this gets at that, you know, one of the key issues in shipbuilding for the United States Navy today is the workforce, right? It's uh, you know, building up, being able to 
get to two plus one submarines to get to the number of, uh, you know, um, uh, any class of ships that the United States wants to build. There's a there's a huge uh, demand for workers. You know, unemployment is low. Skilled workers, that that whole problem set. Um, it's really interesting to look back at this applied history article uh, by Mr. Pitroff um, that that just you know looks at Cramp and Sons, which a lot of people, if you're if you're a geek about U.S. Navy ships and where we built ships over the years, you will be familiar with the that that uh, company's uh, name, Cramp and Sons. Um, but to to you know cover its hundred plus year history, and then to see where the real um, you know problems were, uh, the, the the limiting factors, uh, particularly in the 1940s, it was just very difficult to to add the production capacity that the Navy wanted, um, mostly because of a, a lack of, uh, of, of workers. And, and as you pointed out, Lieutenant Kim's piece uh, very adroitly covered that that topic as, you know, it's a key issue of where you put a fifth yard um, because the work, the workforce is in, incredibly important. So yeah, those are, those are great articles. Um, and we're, as I've, we've said, as Brian and I said uh, last month, we're going to keep hammering on this topic of shipbuilding. Uh, we've got articles coming and we may do a, a dedicated issue in early 2025 on shipbuilding. I think that wraps up the show. Any uh, saved rounds, Bill? Uh, no. Um, Navy plays Temple tomorrow, so the first real test for the football team, and there's a lot of reunions in town. It's starting to feel a little bit like fall here in Annapolis, uh, a little early. Um, but uh, um, So that's what's going on in town here. Or Navy beat Temple. Yep. <laughs> All right. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. Your support is important to everything we do. And if you're not a member, please consider becoming one today by going to usni.org forward slash join. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.